Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome to List NYC. I am your host, Arthur Smiles. It's time again to open the parentheses because tonight we're going to have the perfect presentation to end the year. One of the things that I think Lisp is particularly blessed with is that not only do we have a rich past, but we also have a very bright future. And I think tonight's presentation is going to bring us a little bit of Lisp's past, Lisp's present, and Lisp's future. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, give a brief bio about our speaker. Um, Larry Massacher has been uh, basically an integral part of the foundation of the web. Uh, if you've ever submitted a forum on the web, Larry wrote the spec for that. Uh, for that matter, actually, everyone here who clicked on the link, uh, URLs, he also wrote that with Tim Berners-Lee. But um, tonight, he'll be showing us something else. He'll be showing us Interlist, a uh, list that he co-created with uh, Daniel Barbro, uh, Richard Burton, Peter Do Deutsch, Ron Ron Ronald Kaplan, and uh, Warren Peitelman. And um, they all won the uh, 1992 ACM prize for that. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Larry and the list and the Interlist core team. Great, thank you. Um, when the Software System Award came around and we had a list of hundreds of participants, and so it was a big group effort over time, many years, it was hard to select which six this was the maximum they would let on the award. And it wasn't, wasn't very fair. So this is a project that I want to talk about is a project that we started in 2020 a, with the uh, permission of the owner of the copyrights right, that had it finally, that he had inherited, who gave us permission to release it open source. And so it's a project to take this old list system and make it relevant and work well in modern environments. So here's a little logic of the talk. I want to introduce a few of the people who are uh, helping with the presentation and otherwise are participating. And uh, talk a little bit about history, present and future and spend most of our time on yeah. demos. So, um, so there's me. There's Arun Wells. Arun, are you on? I am indeed, yes. Yeah. Uh, give us a little background about yourself. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Arun Welch. Uh, I started with Interlisp D uh, back in the mid '80s, um, working at uh, Ohio State University, where uh, we we had a bunch of the Xerox D machines, and then um, continued my relationship with uh, the successors of the companies supporting it, <laughs> and you and Envos, uh, as 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 the ownership changed hands. Uh, finally, pretty much stopped working on it uh, in the early 90s. Um, my work mostly was on uh, bug fixing and getting uh, PCL uh, up and running and some of the tools up in there. And uh, you know, um, the networking code, uh, note cards, which is a hypertext system, um, a lot of you know customer support facing uh, kind of things. Great, thank you, Arun. And then Ron Kaplan, who's been a collaborator on this project, it was like we, we started working on the project. It was like 30 years had passed, and it was the same. <laughs> so uh, I, I think I probably predate uh, everyone on this. I started uh, using Lisp at BBN, BBN Lisp, in around 1970. And I moved to uh, uh, to Park. Uh, actually, I trailed along Danny Bobro and Warren Peitelman. Uh, I was a graduate student in psychology. Uh, and technically, I'm a psychologist. Uh, but I was uh, very involved in linguistic modeling, in the psycholinguistic modeling at the time. And that's how I got into uh, using 
list for natural language processing. I was at Park for about 30 years. Uh, I managed the uh, natural language and eventually the AI group. Um, and then since then, uh, after about 30 years, so around uh, 2005, we did a, a startup spin-off that was based on uh, algorithms that had been uh, developed inside Interlist, but then transferred into uh, C for semantic search. And then I was involved. I was uh, we were bought by Microsoft. Uh, I was involved in conversational user interfaces uh, at Nuance, and most recently, I was chief scientist for Amazon Search. And uh, now I'm just post-economic. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I got back into Interlist about three years ago because I wanted to go uh, go back and actually go forward to use it to verify some new theorems that we were proving in some formal language work that I was doing. Thank you, Ron. Sure. And uh, a few other collaborators are on the phone. Herb Jelinek, uh, it's on the way <laughs> joining us. And uh, uh, Blake McBride is helping out with some of the documentation and newcomer welcoming. We have a bunch of different reasons why we, we, we think. Uh, I just want to call out Nick is here, I think, too. Oh, yeah, Nick, Nick, yeah. Ray, Ray. Nick, Nick is the primary developer who's, why don't you say a few words about your, the mic of what you've been doing. <laughs> yeah, so I started uh, working on Interlisp in 1984 doing uh, user interface design tools with um, Austin Henderson. And at the time, it was uh, not uh, emulated on, at least the virtual machine that Interlisp ran on was not implemented in C. It was all running on the D-Machine hardware. And uh, I stuck with Lisp-related things until probably uh, mid to early 90s. Uh, stayed at Park for 31 years. And then not that many years ago, uh, Ron got in touch with me asking if I could uh, fix up the emulated uh, uh, Lisp virtual machine in C said you could run it on a Mac. It had, it had been implemented on big Indian machines, uh, spark stations, uh, in kind of starting nine, uh, somewhere around 89 or 90, I guess. Um, and uh, then it got ported onto small Indian and little Indian machines, and uh, things were not going all that well trying to run it on Mac OS. So uh, I dived in and started fixing up those bits and pieces, and it sort of stuck to me. I've uh, been doing that now for a while. And uh, it's sort of run on all kinds of uh, different hardware now. So between vintage computing and maintaining research, and I was thinking that I was on a research project at Park, was about automatic programmering, and how to how to, the computer could help the user get the program done. This was a novel idea at the time, especially if you're running on time sharing systems. Um, and uh, the common goal is find and fix the bugs, get everything up and running, make some documentation. So the major feature of, of Interlisp is this style of programming, which is not based on files. You don't edit your files. The files are a place where you dump your program to, and maybe you could make a listing to look at it, to print it out and study it, but you don't edit the file. You load it into memory and you edit the memory. You load it in and the file package keeps track. You define a function that keeps track 
of the fact that you defined the function and you haven't stored it on a file. So it asks you where you want to file it. And this, uh, and you write a program by sitting down and you write something and you don't, you have some Canadian case. Well, if the argument is a list, then I'll do this thing. And I'm not sure what I'll do in the other uh, cases. So you just leave it blank. You say T help, give the car to help. When you get there, you test it out on all the cases that you have programmed. And then when you get to the part where you haven't programmed it, it calls out, you say edit, you find it, you have all of the variables and all of the state of the computation that you can look at and, 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 add, and finish, write a little more of your software. It's an awful way to write software if you have a spec that you know what you're doing and you're just trying to implement this spec, get it to work perfectly, then probably you want a top-down design. But for a lot of kinds of programming that we were engaged in at the time was building research prototypes. We didn't quite know what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And, and all of these different features. So there's not one feature which is how to do this. There's a collection of features that support this style of working. And I didn't think that people would, we wrote some papers about you know, power tools for programmers and articles about it. But it was really hard to explain. And, and, and the papers don't do very much good for it, or for it. Don't explain very much. So the idea is how can we get this tool in the hands? I don't imagine many people will like to use Interlist V medley as their primary development environment. It would be nice if we got to that point, but at least use it for long enough to understand how the style of development works. So the other feature is that it's a list virtual machine. So it was portable uh, between different pieces of hardware. There are five different uh, hardware machines which had microprogrammable and had different microcode. Uh, so I worked on the Dorado microcode and then other people worked on the microcode for the other D machines. And then the the idea of porting that to C, well the first the first was too slow. But now with modern processors about two hundred times faster uh, conservatively. Some benchmarks around a thousand times faster. And the easy interactive graphics, small talk inspired. And then list users using user contributed code. Before there was the uh, idea of open source, the predated closed source. Interlist 10, the PDB 10 we released at the time. So there's a bunch of features that I can demo, but I'm going to save this for the end of the session with the idea that uh, Arthur will tell me what demos people want to hear the most of, and I'll try and show you about from the history and DWIM and the file package cleanup, the structure editor for command line structure editor for a while. You'll just see that in, in master scope. Then uh, the online manual, the spy break package. Yeah, that was, so a lot of these things were continued under continual development. And uh, about the op codes, and I can show you some compiled code. Oh, and some of the things that we're doing to shave up, to smooth the edges of what it takes to run medley in a modern environment is we had X, the Xerox character code standard, which is a predecessor for Unicode. But Unicode support was useful if you want to read linguistic files. 
in languages other than English and a clipboard and more familiar key bindings. I still haven't. Okay, uh, before it, this is the way, this is before the Macintosh, before Windows. As we were first launched at the same time that Xerox launched Star. And I can show you some of our GitHub re repos and some of the some issues. Of the issue. That we're working. That we're working. Hello, I Hello, I uh, Do you want to do the uh, uh, demos first, or do you want me to uh, tell you what we have so far for the quest? No, let's wait. Let me go through the slides, and yep. we'll get to Arun and Ron giving demos, and then I'll stick around and do demos. So this is just. A display from the 1100 from AAAI in 1982. I have a somewhere in my background a poster. So this machine for less than $30,000 in 1982. And my Raspberry Pi runs 200 times faster. And this is me trying to sell a, sell a used car. My hand on the on the on the fender. 1132. Uh, display connected to 1132 Dorado, and there are 10 processes running. Mm -hmm. We call them processes, but they were really threads. And, and it was a it was a pain to make the core core of interless thread safe. But I'll show you some of the I think I can show you some of the logic that gets behind there. So the thing to keep in mind is that on the D machines, it was Lisp all the way down. There was Lisp and microcode that implemented the Lisp instruction set, and that was it. So we had to do the scheduler and the, the page, and the garbage here, uh, and the process, and the disk driver, and the floppy driver, the RS-232 driver, and the printer drivers. And every, everything was all in Lisp. And two and networks. Network. Yeah. There are three networking stacks. First was the pop networking stack, Park Universal Packet, three megabit Ethernet. Then there was XNS, the Xerox network standard, which the um, file servers ran, and there were lots of. And then TCP/IP was later. And that's where I learned how to read RFCs and decided I could work on web standards. If I could get Dave Moon and John White and Scott Allman to agree in the cleanup committee, I could get people to work on the web to agree as well. A little bit of history is uh, There's some Google Docs that are pointed to from our homepage that go into this more deeply. Yeah. And what we have, we also have some we have source code from these day from these old interlist systems as well. And, and uh, So you can check that out. And um, Paul, Mc, Paul McJones put a lot of work into interlist history at the Software Preservation Group. He's, a, he's been helping us with the liaison with the Computer History Museum. That's awesome. I think my, my idea is that 
How do you just create a museum exhibit of software? You want to demo it, yeah, that you can preserve it through emulation and then giving people the opportunity to actually use the software, not just read about it or see a video. Uh, so I think this is still interesting territory. And I, I see people doing vintage computing the way of preserving old video games of their youth. And then I think it's interesting to think about how we can do that. There's a, there's a, a fellow, I forget his name, who worked on the revision history of Unix, taking all the different editions of Unix and uh, creating it creating a GitHub repo as if the authors had checked it in. Diomedes Spinelli's. Right. So, um, now I won't, won't spend too much more time on the history. Just that um, between 92 and 2020, there's a little bit of mystery. So we're not quite sure what we have, exactly what version of it's people ask us, if we CLTL2 or CLTL1, well, there's a file called CLT, there's a directory called CLTL2 that we haven't had time to try out. Uh, but a rune getting CLOS to work led this week was a good good step forward. And we have some other things that are uh, still in need of revitalization. So, um, the, the virtual machine implementation is called Maiko. Mm -hmm. And uh, it runs well on Mac OS. It runs on uh, the M1 that I haven't been able to call it, compile it native yet just because of some issues that may be getting fixed this week. It runs well on Linux and WSL as well. Yeah, that's what I'm running on most of the time. And, and there's also a DOS port for those interested in real historical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, so the, the issues, I don't know if they're mainly resolved, but I've been impressed by how well they've been resolved. The C code was written for K and RC long before there was a C standard. And the standard changed some things that are unfortunate. And it was written for a big Indian 32 moon machine. And where all the, the, all the modern processes are little Indian 64 bit machine. Mm -hmm. by having to bite swap around things. And when, you know, so a bunch of things that need to be tested. We found, I found some test directories in one of the dumps that we received of uh, data from Envos in 73. I'm sorry, in 83, 93. Anyway. One of the things we'd like to do is run the ANSI common list tests and see how many of them break. We still don't know. With that, I will turn it over to Arun to give us a demo of CLOS and of rooms. Thanks, Larry. Let's see. Share an application. Does it work? Does, yeah, but you look like you're on mute right now. Oh, there it is. Can you guys see it? Uh, can y'all see this? Can I just you... see a letter. Not yet. Not yet. Uh... Yeah, I don't see your video either. 
Uh, Wait, let me turn off my. I had a little orange box pop up saying dismiss or contact support. I'm not sure what that means. Let me try again. Uh, it worked yesterday when we tested yeah. it. Out. I can <laughs> swear to that. <laughs> yep, definitely worked yesterday. If your video is off, you need to turn it on to start with. Yeah, try that. Try it this way. Is that better? Ah, there we go. Ah, so you have to have your camera on for the video to work. Okay, there we go. Yep. All right. So um, the first thing I'm going to demonstrate is uh, uh, an application that was called Rooms. Um, so we've all gotten used to virtual screens on our uh, computers these days. And Rooms was what really, if not one of the first, was the first system that did so, this. Uh, I'm still well, not well, seeing it. You're still not showing up on the uh, stream. I'm not, I'm not seeing it. If you right. want, you can try maybe disconnecting and reconnecting. Yeah, let me, let me do that. Let's just do that quickly. We just saw his video momentarily before. Yeah, that. yeah, I could see it when it was in the uh, this the big section, but not in the small one. Okay. Right. There you are. I can see you. You can see me. Let's see if we can see the screen. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm seeing something on my screen that is my screen. So yeah. in, in the web browser. So is this yeah. working for everybody else? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry about that. Not sure what happened there. Um anyway, so rooms. It was, if not one of the, but or if not the first, but one of the first ones. And it was based on a metaphor of, as the name implies, rooms. You set up a screen, was called a room, and you could create uh, doors from one screen to another. And you could create a back door, which took you back to whatever screen you came from. <laughs> um, and each screen had a whole little, you know, definition uh, language that you could uh, um, do that defined, you know, what other rooms to include in a room. So this is this room actually has two rooms. It's the main room and this little strip chart at the bottom that was a control panel room that's included in everything else. Can set up a background that's different on every screen, um, different shading, and so on and so forth, so you knew what screen you were on. I actually have a question. Just yeah. out of pure curiosity, um, does this the, does this room concept have any relation? I don't know in which direction with Zork, or like the, you know they have like the Zork machine where you actually have different rooms in the Zork machine when you go uh, when you play that car. You know, I, I don't know that it. Did have okay. that direct? Okay, so there is no. Okay, yeah. so I, maybe that might be it, it, it stemmed yeah. from work done in the Xerox Park user interface research group by Stu Card and oh. others mm -hmm. on um, how people remember things and the yeah. method of the method of loci, as it's called. So uh, uh, that was some of the genesis for it. Yeah. Okay. So this is not only virtual screens. This is hypermedia. Yeah, I'd say yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. a fair description. Yeah. And the the there's a hypertext system, note cards, that really uses that that was de also developed by the same team, largely, and uh, it relies heavily on rooms also. 
Um, we haven't been able to get it running yet. Uh, I'm that's uh, next on my stack. Let's put it that way. Uh, and for it, anyone who next hypercorn, pardon. Go ahead. Did that inspire Mac Hypercorn? Yes, I believe so. There was some cross fertilization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anyone here is from the Java world, but the main implementer of Rooms is a guy named Doug Cutting, who later did um, Hadoop and. Uh, um, Nutch and also Lucene. Nutch and Lucene, yeah. So this was one of his earlier uh, works. He was actually my intern. Yeah, he's a uh, he's phenomenal. So one of the other things I'm going to demonstrate is uh, the CLOS, CLOS, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> different people do it differently. And uh, one of the things about the way Interlisp D Medley, uh, uh, the philosophy was that you had a, it was a programming environment, right? You had all the tools built into it. So part of the, as PCL evolved, so did the tools for editing PCL and 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 CLOS. Uh, yeah, uh, fair uh, fair notification. At the time that this was being developed, PCL was class <laughs> for, 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 I think, all implementations, uh, or certainly most by the end of it. Um, this, uh, this is based on the, ver the 91, 1991 version. Uh, 1992 version of PCL was a little bit more CLTL2. It had things like def package, which doesn't exist in this version of Medley. So uh, while we did get it working in night back in '92, uh, I don't have it working now. <laughs> so um, just you know, fair. Does it have a meta object protocol? Yes, it does. Um, Good. Yeah, uh, the meta object protocol as it was defined in '91, not as it was defined fully in Gregor's book, right? Um, <laughs> just. <laughs> So, so here's the here's the browser. Uh, you know, it's it's you, we, you can just very easy to start one up. You just tell it the where the route you want to do it, and it brings it up. Um, and uh, you can use it for. Um, so I I went and found there's a. So I'm going to actually let me cut and paste. It'll be quicker than me typing. Uh, there's a Lisp cookbook out there uh, that has you know here's how to learn Lisp and how to learn uh, the various bits of it. Um, so I define a class. I define a subclass And if I come back here and recompute, there they show up, right? Um, and I can um, look at the class and see what the slots are. It brings up a, a window saying, uh, let me move this one out of the way. Uh, you know, here's how the class is defined in the uh, structure editor. I can make an instance of a couple of, uh, we make a couple instances, and then we can use the tools that are in Medley to say, for example, inspect P1. And it brings up an inspector where I'm looking at the, the slot name, oops, whacked it, um, and the value, right? Um, and, and see what that looks like. I can create some methods and start with a def generic 
and then add a couple methods. And now if I go here, I can say what methods are defined. And it says, oh, look, there's a method. And I can bring that up in an editor. Um, so it's, and we can also, you know, look at a, if we look at a particular cla class definition, um, we can edit it. We can add a method to it, and it brings up a blank. Uh, specialize it, brings up another one. Uh, we can look at the the methods whether they're inherited, you know, or or local, so on and so forth. Um, all the tools for basically doing you know object oriented programming exist in this environment, just like they did for loops or key or any of the other object languages that were implemented on top of interlisp d mm -hmm. uh, which, and, and, and you know right. so if we want to you know look at what's defined uh, what methods exist for standard class for example these are everything that's in there and you know they, it brings up the before methods if they ex such exist etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's a quick demo of uh, some of the tools that were built on top of uh, Interlisp D for uh, programming within the environment. If you have a minute, maybe you should show set it editing code in the structure editor. Ah, all right. Uh, actually, Larry, would you rather? <laughs> yeah, I like that. yeah. So. But let's get to, get to Ron first. Yep. All right, so I'm done. How do I uh, unshare? Um, I think you can just click the same thing again. All right. You go. Okay. 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 So then I click. Do I have to wait for him? Okay. Um, yeah, you can click it now. So now let's see what I can do. Um, Lower left hand corner. You are. So Great. is that? Um, you see everything? Yeah. yeah. See it. Okay. So um, this is uh, what we call the LFG system. And LFG stands for Lexical Functional Grammar. And that's a theory of grammar that actually I developed in the late 70s uh, and was adopted and, and is used uh, by linguists around the world for writing descriptions of particular phenomena in um, particular languages. Uh, and when we developed it, uh, the idea, when I proposed the idea was to have a theory of grammar that was computationally sensible uh, and you know could be implemented. There were a lot of theories of grammar, Chomsky and, and friends that were undecidable and even if decidable, impossible. Uh, so uh, we wanted a theory that would be both mathematically sound, linguistically adequate, and actually implementable. And the implementation was in this particular system, the LFG, what we call the Grammar Writers Workbench. Um, and this was done in the early 80s. I actually have a videotape of uh, a demo, of me giving a demo of this system uh, where the first five minutes of the videotape, I'm uh, uh, introducing a mouse. You know, I have to tell people that the mouse is this thing that you roll around on the table, and when you roll it around, something moves on the screen, and when you click a button, something happens on the screen, and so forth, because that was quite novel at that time. Uh, the goal of the system, you know, there's a distinction between uh, linguistics and another discipline called grammar engineering and grammar engineering is like programming it's large scale it's finding out all the interactions uh, uh, finding out you know the hard cases the easy cases and so forth the test cases 
Whereas in linguistic theory, uh, you don't write a, a grammar, you write a, pro, a, a paper and you publish it and you have you know, three examples and two counter examples and that's the way that works. But uh, the goal of this system is to provide a tool that would enable a grammar engineer to make progress on a much more comp complicated and comprehensive uh, description of a language. So it's layered in on top of, of, of Interlist, uh, but it's actually implementing uh, you know, a, a different formal system. So I'll give you a demonstration of that. I have some, uh, uh, let's see, my mouse. Oh, I've got to look at the, my real screen, not, not you guys. So over here, okay, can you uh, see my cursor moving? Um, yeah. Okay. So this is just a very trivial sentence, just to give you a flavor for what's going on. So this this actually is a parser that that uh, interprets grammars written in this lexical functional format and applies a grammar and a lexicon to particular strings. In this case, the trivial string, the girl devours the banana. And what it shows over here uh, on the right is basically the context-free phrase structure tree, uh, a normal kind of parse tree that you see. And then associated with that tree is an attribute value matrix that pulls out uh, more or less the interpretation, the semantic interpretation of it. So uh, here you see a string of world, words where the girl is a noun phrase, and the bowers is a verb, uh, the banana is a noun phrase together with the verb, it makes up a verb phrase, which makes up a sentence. Down here in this attribute value matrix, you see the grammatical functions, subject and object, features like tense, present, number singular. And you also see uh, the predicate argument structure. So this is a proposition. The sentence expresses a proposition where it's devour applied to two arguments. One is the girl that has all these properties and the other is the banana that has all these properties. So that would be the output, this predicate argument relationship that you might use then for application scenarios. And later we use this for uh, a semantic search, uh, that kind of large scale semantic search. So um, that's basically the uh, cycle that you go through. Uh, sometimes uh, you type in a sentence, you're testing something, and you go to this next sentence that I have here, which is ungrammatical. It's the girls devours the banana. And so when I parse that, uh, the box up on top here says, uh, yeah, I got a good phrase structure tree, but I didn't get a good attribute value matrix. And the reason is that there's a conflict between uh, the verb wanting a singular subject and this particular subject of the girls being uh, plural. So that's a flag, uh, basically equality, inconsistency and equality. And you can actually uh, see the equations that describe this attribute value structure. Oops, I'm getting a message that I uh, unplugged my uh, Mac, so I can plug it in. Okay, so uh, uh, this uh, associated with the nodes of the tree is something that produces a bunch of equations. Now, there's an equation solver, a unifier, uh, and the solution to that set of equations when they're consistent uh, is this attribute value matrix. And when they're inconsistent, you, it highlights the equations that altogether didn't work. Uh, and you see these numbers, F4 and F6. And over here in the tree structure, I turned on the node numbering. So you now know that uh, this equation that says that the number is plural comes from that noun F4 from girl, uh, from noun four, which is girls. So this is the idea for helping you kind of locate uh, where things are. Um, you can also, uh, if I click on this, say, well, let's see, I want to look at the, at the rule. So, you know, I hold down the control key, I click, and now I can inspect the rule. 
uh, that, that uh, was used to uh, analyze that verb phrase. And this is the grammar notation of this lexical functional uh, grammar uh, theory. So uh, then you have things where you can interrogate. So uh, if I wanted to uh, find all of the rules that uh, use NP that, that involve noun phrases, I want to I want to find out all the callers, let's say, of NP. Then uh, <clears throat> all of these rules are indexed into this database uh, so that you can find and trace. Uh, and edit uh, the things that this is actually an editor, the, the text editor and interlist that's used to, uh, in, a, in a special printer, all this programmatic access to the editor. But if you're an implementer of the system itself, you might want to drop down a level. And so uh, I can also bring up the internal data structure that, that is inside the implementation for that node. So this is the inspector again, that I think you just saw. And these are the, the properties that a node has. Uh, and you can then you know, uh, look through uh, and trace, trace through the data structures if you're implementing the algorithms. Uh, and I'll finish up just by uh, a little demonstration, again, of the integration of this into the medley system, the programming system. So uh, there's the system called Masterscope, which is again a, a almost a natural language interface to the file system and the relationships between all the functions that you've defined in the variable. So I can say um, who contains the function that I have to know uh, unify, <laughs> and it tells me that that's contained on the file uh, unify. But I can also use. Can interrupt. Uh, uh, actually, we have a question from uh, Dexter. He's asking, "Is there a tiling mode for this?" Is there a what? A tiling mode? No. Uh, in what sense a tiling mode? You mean for tiling the windows? Would you like to uh, ask the question yourself? There isn't a tiling mode. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't, for, for uh, re rearranging the window. I3. Says like I3, etc. You guys familiar with I3? I can't, actually, I can't hear. Oh, organize the tiles. I mean, organize the windows. Excuse How me. to organize the windows. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Now I get what you're saying. Okay. So, um, you know, the wind, the, the organ layout of the windows, the organization of the windows is uh, done by the list program. Uh, so um, there are algorithms uh, for these particular windows mm -hmm. uh, that move things around in various ways, but uh, that's just because um, there are functions, you know, that you can call, the nearest can call, that can say, you know, find me a place on the screen that's free, or, you know, if I want to overlap or whatever it is, group these things together. So that would be in the implementation of this grammar writer's workbench with its particular windows mm -hmm. and how they should be organized. But actually here I squeezed the windows uh, together a little bit because I wasn't sure how much would show on different displays. But let me finish up. Uh, uh, um, let's say, oops, who calls uh, Unify? And that's all the functions uh, that call uh, that function, which is contained on the file unify. And I can say, um, uh, who contains those? And those are in two files, solve and unify. And finally, I can say something like edit, where any calls unify. And now it will drive the structure editor through all the functions that were in that list and bring the ad uh, editor up uh, at each uh, place where this function is called. So I can say if I wanted to add an argument systematically or uh, find the place where it goes in. So 
so this master scope system drives the editor uh, and then I make an edit and then it remembers the changes that I made so the file packet will tell me uh, what files need to be dumped and so forth. By the same token, the grammar system is integrated with the file package too. So if I edit a rule, it will tell me what file that rule is on and ask me whether I want to save it uh, you know, uh, to be loaded in later. So that's basically to give you a flavor of something that's, you know, in a formal system that's implemented on top of uh, the interlisp environment and is integrated into the kind of residential programming idea uh, that uh, is the underlying notion that uh, kind of is distinguishing about the interlisp platform. So with that, I think, um, uh, I think that's all. Is there any other questions? Does, uh, for, for uh, medley interlist for that, for the whole distribution, does LFG come with it? No, LFG is a, is a separate memory image. We call them sysouts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and, and this system, we used to distribute it from Park. It's now uh, distributed from the University Constance in Germany, which is uh, where a lot of the LFG uh, community uh, file, file system is. Uh, so uh, it's available, uh, although I haven't been updating it recently, so I don't know how much is uh, actually working over there. I should do that. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and there's a manual that comes with it. Uh, you know, the manual is actually, uh, uh, so in here, you can bring up the manual and you can say, I want, I want to see what it says about templates. So again, this is, oh, whoops, I'm clicking the wrong window there. So, so this, this out is not in the Interlisp uh, GitHub? No, it's not, in the, it's not in the GitHub. It's not in the Git repository. Okay. You could put it there, I suppose, but uh, I hadn't been thinking about it for this. Uh, because the community that uses this is the linguistic community more than the programming community. And we're using this right now, uh, there's a bunch of theorems that we've been proving. Uh, so, so this theory of grammar is NP-complete. The membership problem, the parsing problem is NP-complete in general. And uh, we have some theorems about certain restrictions that guarantee that it's polynomial uh, and that, and the argument is that those restrictions are still compatible with human languages, that in a way the formalism overshoots a little bit. So we've been investigating that, investigating the constants and so forth you know, using this uh, environment. That's awesome. So, yeah, we just had a 50 page monograph in computational linguistics uh, that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. <laughs> It's, you know, is it really that hard, you know, <laughs> to prove these well, things? Babies can do it, so. Uh... <laughs> yeah. right. On so, the other hand, uh, we have a lot of brain processing, because I, I, adults, it's hard to, to uh, learn how to, at least for me, it's probably impossible for me to learn other languages. So, it's <laughs> child's play, so we mentioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, thinking about easy cases is easy. Thinking about all cases exactly. is, uh, is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think I turned off. Did I turn off the screen? Um, it's still on. I think if you hit the screen thing again, uh, video. I'm seeing Larry's now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Maybe I'll, maybe we're on Larry. Okay. I switched it. Right. Okay, back to Larry. So, uh, I'm willing to try and uh, demo any feature. Okay. So, um, Kent Pittman asked for a demo on DWIM. On DWIM? Yep. Do what I mean. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. So. That's, a great, that's a great name. Warren Teitelman had that as his car's license plate, whim. Uh, I forget how to define a function. 
I think you should magnify the screen or magnify the window rather that you're typing in. The print's pretty small. Yeah, if you just share that window, if you can do that with your browser, that'll make it bigger. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to uh, read some of the comments that we have on the comment section because I think there's some really good historical nuggets. Um, Kent Pittman wrote uh, that Pavel Curtis at Xerox Park worked on Moo, which was mud object oriented, where mud was multi user dungeons, which was a descendant of Zork. So there may have been a cultural overlap. I think Pavel went off to placeware doing other stuff that evolved into newer things. So that's very interesting. Yeah, uh, the time, the time was involved in Linearless too. I think. Yeah, he wrote the uh, Commonless compiler. The re the reason I kind of made the connection is because you use rooms, and also the Z machine is kind of like a list machine, basically. Um, I mean, the programming language is a is a form of list, so it uses angle brackets, which in itself is fascinating. Um, but yeah, it has rooms and you know uh, commands and things like that. And uh, I think he, he originally developed it on Lisp, my understanding, um, if I remember correctly. So yeah. I'm wondering if there's, oh, you know, oh yeah, we'll make rooms too. Um, um, you know, where one came from and one ended, I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know, I ha my office was next door to Austin's when he was. Uh, uh doing this and uh there wasn't there was no discussion of uh of anything relating to uh to zork or any other adventure things going on i mean we were talking about windows and rooms physical metaphors for for things mm -hmm. Mm. And so there's actually a question here about the Doug cutting uh, implement rooms. I'm actually not sure about that. I I don't know that Doug is working on rooms. I mean, he's working on information retrieval, information access. I think yeah. I thought it was before that. Um, so he was an intern, and then I hired him uh, uh, to work with Jan Pedersen yeah. on the information access problem. I don't know that he actually worked on rooms. Yeah, Austin Henderson wrote most of the code, uh, and he and Stu spent a lot of time, uh, you know, hunched over machines, staring at this. Oh, maybe I misremembered. All right. So here I have two exec windows. Uh, this one is this is commonless. This one is interless. It's one address space. It's not different environments. It's just that the if you look at the this who line, this was a user package. So they differ by which read table they use. Is and uh, uh, what package they default to. So from the point of view of common list, interlist is just another package in the different namespace, IL. And you can write functions, you write code that, that uses uh, both. Uh, Are we losing sound here? No, I'm just um, having trouble typing. Ah, okay. So, um, for, 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 for me, I, I don't exactly understand what DWIM actually is. Could you just give me a brief introduction to it? It was a set of features, somewhat independent, 
that took Liska when you had an error, you got a, you were about to call an error. They took over and said, well, maybe this isn't really an error. Maybe this is something that is written. Oh, so we're trying to uh, recover from errors. So, so the easy, easy situation would be, yeah, you, you mistype the name of a variable into the interpreter or even in a function and it comes to it, it notices that it's unbound, but there's another variable that it knows about that's in that environment and the spelling corrector would run and say, maybe you meant this and ask you. Uh, so with an automatic spelling correction, for example, <coughs> uh, maybe parenthetic stuff would be fixed up. And then uh, a number of extensions that were more like macros uh, would be implemented by transformation that it could do on uh, behind the source code that you actually wrote. So like the if then statement or the for statement and so forth uh, would be interpreted by that. And, and, and there was a rumor at one point in time that if you turned off DWIM, the system would not work at all because there was... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know the truth of that, but <laughs> was seamless based on DWIM? Is is what? C list. C the conversational list. No, the C list um it was, it was, was used to translate C lisp into executable. Yeah, because Larry's writing some C list right now, I believe. What I always felt was the coolest feature was the ability to transform strain nines and zeros into parentheses. Right. Well, that was part of it. Yeah. One place where I experienced uh, DWIM is that interlisp is case sensitive. So it has, it, you know, it differentiates the case of uh, characters. And uh, I was assigning stuff to lowercase variables then when I put them in uppercase it showed them so the DWIM system was was detecting the case difference and correcting it uh, which actually gave me the false impression that it was not case sensitive and there were a lot of jokes about it being do what Warren means <laughs> Rather than you know, well, do what I knew. There was another uh, acronym, WIS, which was do what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. What do you keep getting in there? I, you know, I meant what I meant. I guess, I guess eventually, uh, if, Dim, if you needed, you required DWIM to run everything, eventually, I guess it would um, subsume all of interlist and it would just be DWIM yeah. <laughs> at the end. Well, it becomes a black hole, and then we all get sucked into it. So a lot of things would die that I think it's a good idea if the default is no. <laughs> the problem is uh, sometimes people didn't mean it. <laughs> but there was a sense of being friendly, <laughs> uh, like, um, I guess it doesn't work anymore. You're looking for Dwim cute plug? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that wasn't, uh, that was trying to be friendly in the sense of uh, if you logged in late at night, it would say, gee, you're up late tonight, Ron. <laughs> or, uh, you know, if you, if you kept making the same typo, it would say, you're having a lot of trouble typing that, aren't you? Yeah, that was very annoying. Uh, so uh, that was the first thing I learned to turn. That was Warren's idea of friendliness. Uh, and it was one of the first things I learned to turn off. <laughs> the ancestor of uh, the paperclip. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that you try to turn off, right? Mm hmm.
No, I'm not seeing the screen now. You're not. I'm seeing it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. See it. Um, you could try clicking on him directly. Um, uh, on Larry, that that brings him back. Larry, look for Larry's uh, box. It probably wants him to talk, so that then it will draw All right. focus. Yeah, he could talk a little more. There you go. Talk a little less. Hmm. So this was last edited by me in 1985. It has a system of automatically inserting who edited things at what date as a comment. It's part of the file package. And uh, I don't see any. So, Larry, you're using one of the three editors that I can think of in the system, right? You're using S Edit. Yeah. Do you want to say something about the editors? This is a structure editor. Um, it gives you the appearance of editing text, but you can uh, I take this thing and say eval this. And it gives me a. a No, wrong, wrong key. I'm out of E. Imagine what Emacs Lisp editing would be like if that were really the bottom level and there was no level of editing, just characters, dumb, dumb characters. All right, so if you do call edit, if we call eval, it says the username is that. And point at one of these things and say edit. So you have to say yes there, yeah. So right there um, is an example of. Uh, the fact that the file system is implicitly part of the environment. So he said to edit a function that only existed you know, in compiled form, but the system knew what file that function was on wow. uh, and was able to get the symbolic version and bring it up in the editor. Mm -hmm. And if he edited it, uh, then it would get dumped and so mm -hmm. forth back into the file. Yeah. Plus, any changes that you make to it uh, take effect immediately. Yeah. Actually, I um, I think uh, back in the '90s, um, IBM had um, was it called WebSphere or whatever? But basically, it was a it was a Java IDE, right? And it had pretty much the same concept, except version control and everything was built into the into the IDE itself. And then when you clicked on any method, it would open up a file of just that thing. And you can yeah. click back and forth. So, so it, you know, it's it's amazing. It's basically the precursor to all of that. Though I think in a lot of ways, um, because of uh, version control, that we kind of, um, or maybe I was thinking because I was thinking about this uh, uh, today. Actually, that you know, one of the you know, um, when you look at this, how in a lot of ways we're watching something that's uh, that. Um, it's very even advanced for today, for today's age. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, while you guys were working on this with these very expensive computers, everybody else who had these very, um, you know, cheap, simple computers at the time, right? Um, and the fact is, is that all the, all this development, all, there, there's a lot of development that's kind of been, uh, a lot of, in a lot of ways, a lot of the culture that's developed from that, we're kind of still living to to this day. Like I can only imagine if everyone had like this in the, in the early eighties, what could have, what, what would be different uh, now? 
you know, if anyone was even used to this. I mean, this would be like for me, like a dream back then. You, you. So there's always a contrast, with, you know, somebody in this message was talking about the East Coast and the West Coast and so forth. So, um, you know, this interlist system is really mouse driven. The interface is really dependent on the mouse and moving things around and so forth. Uh, and, you know, the WYSIWYG editing, uh, you know, very much driven by the mouse. And what we used to observe was that the Lisp machine lists that those uh, were more text driven, uh, more standard kind of file driven. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was one of the AAAIs or one of the you know conferences where you know, we can exhibit. Uh, and uh, they had a mouse on the list machine, but in fact, people didn't really use it. Uh, and what I saw in their demo was the reason why. They, they really had not understood the kind of implementation of the mouse that we had in the microcode, uh, so that the mouse tracked very, very quickly, very, very accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, on the list machine, if you move the mouse around in a circle, you could watch the cursor trying to catch up to it, because it was just not running at the speed that uh, even of a user interface. And so, uh, I, I think that aspect of implementation discourage the kind of mouse-oriented, display-oriented uh, stuff that uh, was the hallmark of all the stuff from the Alto onward at, at Park. Do you recall what year that was that you're referring to there? I'm sorry, what? Um, what what year it was that you're referring to? Uh, well, that was in the early, 70, uh, early 80s, probably 83, 84, 85, somewhere in there. Yeah, because some um, the, the original list machine window system was quite fast using something called sheets. And when it was made class based it, or flavors based was actually the first thing yeah, right. that's that slowed it down quite a bit. Um, and later when it was made presentation based, it slowed down even more. But I would say in fairness to those things, Lisp has always slowed things down, like by doing things that needed garbage collection, by doing various other things and sort of driven the culture to say, OK, let's make this faster again. So there's been some good that's come of that, yeah. even as not always. Well, so in, in Interlist and in Medley, uh, the, which was originally done on the Alto, uh, and memory, you know, you had that 68K or, you know, 128K of memory. So. It was all about how could you minimize, you know, constant coding and all this stuff to, to do things that you, that nobody cares about anymore. Uh, but you were willing uh, to take yeah. a performance hit to get the memory. Uh, so uh, the, list, the original paper by Peter Deutsch was about a compact instruction set for list. So let's take one of these things. Um, Let's see, ESW, these are the processes that are running, the exec to give it the keyboard. I need a window timer. <laughs> there it is. And um, so let me ask a question about this interface uh, that, we, uh, that we're using. So is it true that whenever anybody speaks, the screen sharing disappears? That's sort of what I'm um, actually. Well, okay, so the uh, it's the um, the live stream is actually following uh, what I'm looking at. Um, so, because I'm looking at Larry's screen only, even if you're talking, um, it'll hear you. Your voice will be projected, but it will not show you unless I click on you. Uh huh. Yeah. So right now, I just have everything on Larry's screen. However, for, that's that's for the live stream. It's following me because I'm the moderator. For you, you can click on any person you want and watch them. Um, 
you don't have to watch the speaker. But if I just I think, wanted to, I mean, I, like I when I was talking, the person who's talking, but I, I never, I'm never sure how that works exactly. So when I when I was talking, was it going back and forth between me and the display? Um, the no, it wasn't because well, me, it was, the live stream's not. Um, maybe your computer is, but the live stream isn't because the live stream's following me because I'm the moderator. Uh -huh. And I'm pointing it uh, only at uh, Larry. I'm actually directing the camera, so to speak. Uh huh. So, Larry, what are you showing now? Oh, uh, Roger. But you have Spy running. I'm running to figure out why the Spy Browser is so slow. Well, <laughs> sorry. So, this is a picture. What SPY does is it samples, this gets an interrupt every, I think it's 60 times a second. If whatever you're running, it calls, calls some, calls the scheduler, or which, unless it just discovers it's in an uninterruptible section, which you can delimit for thread safeness is uh, it records the stack on the way down. One of the feature, early features of Interlips 10 was the spaghetti stack, treating the stack as a object, not quite first class, but almost. And you see this in uh, as the way of uh, uh, if you have a breakpoint or an error, um, so you type in control B and you get a breakpoint interrupted below, below current flash. So it's spending a lot of its time flashing the carrot mm -hmm. on and off. Mm -hmm. Take this thing, carry flash. You can say inspect code. Here's a window with the compiled. We're uh, working late tonight. So uh, this, this is what I was in the middle of executing. You can see that, that it's very compact code for, so this is global variable, push it on the stack, jump if it's false, to byte 252, otherwise take the global variable carrot timer and call the function timer expired with one argument. And if it's not false, if it's not nil, then jump here and and, uh, and here you see cutter was a opcode, opcode one, the car is opcode one. Then push the small integer constant 64 onto the stack and look at the uh, little of your last key state. Anyway, it's pretty straightforward transition from uh, Lisco to this opcode set. It got uglier uh, with the uh, increase of the address space that was done around between Medley 2 and Medley 3.5, which is what we were started with. I'm wondering if this is a Y2K problem. We have a few of those. Nothing, nothing.
uh, yeah, I'm just inspecting. All of the data structures are available to you. I was going to show you that some of this a little distracting. So anyway. Let's go back to my slides. So I showed you the history you think at the time it was novel that, that uh, get back to blinking character. Karen. So uh, while we see if anyone wants to see anything else, I want to read a few more comments. Um, yeah. We have a lot of comments today, which is great. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, a code report uh, said that Medley Interlist reminds me a lot of Pharaoh. Whoops. I'm sorry. It's scrolling here. Um, whoops. I lost this. Okay, I went too far. Let me read that again. Uh, okay, again, uh, Medley Interlist, a code report mentions Medley Interlist reminds me a lot of Pharaoh, the newest small talk derived environment, which I guess makes sense because small talk came from Xerox. Yeah, no, there was a lot of collaboration and envy and uh, it was there was three different programming environments at Park. Mm -hmm. One was based on Mesa, which was what they were using, uh, and Cedar, which is an evolution of Mesa, but uh, with garbage collection added. Cedar had a child with a new window interface and uh, was pursuing that direction. Smalltalk and Interlist shared a lot. We were both down at Park Place, the separate building from the main park lab. The Smalltalk guys were upstairs and we were down. And it was uh, Peter Deutsch wrote the, wrote the first bytecode interpreter and bytecode system for the Alto, and then went on to do the small talk one as well. So there's a lot of commonality. All right, this is what I was going to try and do. So this runs considerably faster than it did 20, 30 years ago. But uh, here, let's try that again. So the, I pointed to the node in the spy tree. So sometimes it hit and got a block, but most of the time was spent in this move ring, which I brought up the, and this is use of the record package. 
It's fetch and replace. Right. Yeah, I think you had showed me like a feature of um, like um, was it like expand? What was that to uh, to show like what what fetch actually does? You can actually see that. Yeah. Forgot what the uh, oh yeah expand. That's right. Yeah, the little expand button. I think this is really cool. There's an error. Oh, I guess do you want to that running? <laughs> Can't get over that. Um, while you figure that out, I want to just read a couple more comments. There was some uh, memeing going on. Um, uh, uh, Rohit Carr said, any sufficiently advanced autocorrector for case sen sensitivity errors is indistinguishable from a case insensitive system. And then Raul chimed in, any sufficiently advanced autocorrector is indistinguishable from a real smart human, a really smart human. <laughs> All right, so I just didn't have the record loaded because okay. you don't you don't need it you need the record if you compile the code, except for if you're actually defining a new data type. So what was critical to for building the operating system in list all the way down to the drivers was the ability to talk about bit packed memory data structures. It's not everything was a pointer. Mm -hmm. And the, to be able to do that, so you'll see that uh, for efficiency, you might, you might use more packed data structures than you would if you were just doing depth structs. So here, uh, so expand. And I'll do so. Let me see if I can add it. Larry, are you just changing the display when you do the expand, or like if you saved it out that way, would you be saving different code, or you just? Uh, Let me show you. Hi. And then and then right. And, and It it changed the code. It's not just uh, changing the display. Yeah, you can see. Interesting. Sounds a little more dangerous that way. Or you can always undo. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Only until you leave the editor, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But you also haven't uh, uh, written it out to a file. You can uh, reset from the. Uh, yeah. This is load, load movements. So the the uh, this is not an eval quote loop. It's an eval command interpret. I, I, actually, Larry, before you go any further, I want to point out something you just did there for folks. Who, there, there's been discussion in the chat about the difference between a residential environment and a file-based environment. And what you just did there, where you said load 
funds uh, move ring was you you treated the file system as a func as as a database for the functions, and you said from this particular file load the fun namely Hanoi load the function move ring, which is a very different way than if you were working in a Emacs based thing like Slime where you said, I, I, I don't believe that has the capability, maybe it's, I haven't used it in a little while, of being able to say, just load this one function from that particular file, where that's intrinsically built into this environment. Right. Yeah, if you look at the files, Uh, the, the other thing that's in, in the chat that's maybe uh, worth mentioning is uh, somebody I think is asking whether or not when you load a file, somehow the text of the file is now in memory. And that's not true. What's in memory now is basically the list parse structure, the S expression that represents the function. And what you're doing when you're editing is not editing text, but you're moving cars and quitters around in a structure editor. And changing uh, for, for anyone new and then they right? reprinted to the file. Yeah, just want to mention because he's pretty new at Lisp. Um, so uh, when when, he, when we say car and cutter, uh, every um, a lit, basically there are these structures like called pairs, and car is the first element in the structure, and cutter is the second element of the structure, and from that they build lists. So every all the code you see here, um, this is the idea of code and data are the same thing. So really, you can look at this as code, right? Or you can say, okay, this is a, this is a uh, list with lambda as a, as a symbol. Um, and so that's what you're editing um, in there. And then it writes it out as text. So it parses it into a text format, and then it reads it from a text format into a computer format where you actually have symbols, lists, uh, those type of things, not just uh, characters. So I just wanted to make that clear for uh, you want to say something about the other two editors? Yeah, there's uh, the older editor, and then is uses commands. So that comes down from Minute List Ten, in other words, from the uh, REPL based systems. Yeah. Uh, or any is ring region as a field. I've right, been a while since I've used this. <laughs> So <laughs> it's demos, wonderful demos. Uh, I actually have a, I have a comment from the uh, live stream on YouTube. Uh, Venue Gopal says, uh, this takes me down memory lane. I worked at Fuji Xerox Research Labs back in the mid 80s and worked on Interlist B, Harmony to Koto. Uh, yeah. There's a machine translation system on it that was used to translate from English to Japanese, used LFG as well. The only environments that I've seen come close to it is small talk. Right. So who was who was that from? Uh, venue Gopal. Gopal. G O P A L. Uh, the the emulator, the Myco emulator that we were working on, was developed at Fuji Xerox, uh, originally on Sun workstations, in fact. Right. Well, we had a pretty intense year or two getting it to run well enough on a Spark. Yeah. There was it, awful hacks. It, it, it was on the original 6800 Suns. <laughs> yeah, 68 case. Yeah. And. Everyone. 
I have the scoop on Maroon's history now, if anyone is interested. So yes. I'll take that as yes. So yeah. Austin yeah. Henderson wrote the original rooms at Park. Doug Cutting rewrote it from scratch based on their paper for inclusion in the commercial list system that you're looking at now. And uh, uh, Doug's version stayed true to the Stu Card Austin Henderson design, but was from scratch. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I, um, I think Doug might have been my roommate at the time, so uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Man, we got a lot of great comments. Um, there was a question that I had that I just lost. Let's see if I can find it again. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of scrolls out of control here. Um, okay. Um, well, I'll just I'll put John in first. Uh, John said, I worked with Austin Henderson on Trillium when he was in the UK visiting Europark. I was at AI Limited in London, who was commercializing Trillium and reselling the 1108 and Loops in Europe. Fun times. Um, let's see. Hey, hey, uh, does, does he have any? Does he have any uh, of the Trillium sys outs <laughs> still? Uh, I don't know. Um, he's on the he's on the list here. So if you want, you guys can we can talk afterwards about that. Um, and there was another thing about, uh, and unfortunately, I can't find the question. Um, uh, but basically about connecting to um, networks. Let's see. I'll see if I can find it. Well, there is a lot of code that we're made, we've mainly been marking as obsolete. There's a whole implementation of NFS, for example. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's for right. version one of NFS, which good luck finding a server that implements version one. Yeah, exactly. Then PUP protocols and XNS, you won't find any routers around to route mm -hmm. it. So, um, okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's all right. The PSW in the background is this NS gate listener, which is listening for uh, listening for an, an XNS gateway, which I don't think you'll find in the Ethernet packet. <laughs> it's gonna be a long way. <laughs> it will be a long way. Yeah, the uh, Cisco routers used to route XNS up to uh, somewhere around, I don't know, iOS 10, maybe, maybe 8. I believe there was an RFC explaining how to encapsulate XNS connections over TCP. Uh, yeah. Which would make, which would eliminate the routing problem. Yeah. All right, but uh, you need a clearinghouse, which is the XNS version of DNS. Yes. Yeah. You you probably wouldn't. You you would only want to do it inside a local environment anyway, because XNS is chatty. All right. There are some problems that I don't know. I, I didn't really speak to about the uh, problems with the version file system and device root directories versus github and relative paths that was the hard one and um, interlist kind of presumes that the file system has versions and that you can have the old version and the new version open at the same time it we, we were at the time pretty printing would took a long time 
So if you already had the file map, you could just copy from one to one device to the other without having then they had to rewrite, yeah, and they had to reprint print things that were changed. Uh, venue Gopal uh, uh, chimed in. He said, yes, I was involved a little in the Mako pro effort. Good. Might have been. Oh, there you go. So there is, Hanoi was done for the Koto release, uh, list users Koto. And it's fully corrected. The Dwim Dwimly said, so we... right. Now, this is not actually. So, what's interesting about that is you see the table of contents for the file that's interpretable by list. Yeah. So the way, the way that this works is that the, every file has a controller called its comms, on and comms, that says what's supposed to go when you say make this file. Well, uh, it's it, and uh, it says we'll confine. So there are a bunch of functions. Do Hanoi find other Hanoi? Hanoi demo move this move ring. Right, and then there's a variable called annoy windows, which is in the initialized to nil. And then the, all of these things are on a, a don't copy, that is, don't put the, the records definitions in the compile file, you don't need them. And also these things are constants, so that the compiler will just expand them to their value. Uh, and then these variables are uh, odd ring size, shade, even ring shade. So, Okay, um, I have some other comments here that I saved. Um, uh, Kent Pittman says, uh, uh, so that's why I was asking about macros. I, I would swear that I read the Interlist manual, but then we use the language that said that if you turned off DWIM, you would not get macro expansion because the interpreter was an error co uh, correction. But Larry seems to have confirmed today that this is was later fixed. So that's correct, right? Uh, I don't know what it means to turn off Dwim because it wasn't really a, thing, a single thing. Okay. A lot of little bits. There's more a philosophy than okay. it was a single thing. I see. And okay. I was just looking, looking at the eval code. Uh, so edit, edit it. Say check, check uh, Dwim flag or Dwimify flag. Um, another comment we have from David can help is, uh, would there be too much effort in porting emacs.el package in, to operate within the world of interlist follow-up? Could there that conversation be automated? Clincher, can I run emacs and interlist? I know there were some other qu uh, questions about that too. So what are your thoughts about emacs and uh, interlist? So emacs list. He makes this has its own bytecoded interpreter and compiler, and it has a, 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 a odd data model with buffer level variables. 
that our Emacs list is really tied to the buffers. Yeah. In a way that I don't think it, there was some work in communicating to uh, a lower shell. Yeah, there, there, there is a Lisp uh, library package, Lisp user to library, whatever you want to call it, for communicating through it through a shell to an, an external Emacs. But you run into the problem of what's going on in that interconnection, i.e. Emacs is not, Emacs based files don't have this notion of what's in the, in, in, in the interlisp, you know, residential environment, right? So it's, it exists, but I'm not convinced of its usefulness. Let's put it that way. Cool. So yeah, open, uh, open project for anyone who'd like to do it. <laughs> um, actually, I found the original, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll just ask this question and then I'll let you guys continue. But Phil uh, says, uh, how usable is Interlist med medley, well, medley Interlist in Docker Linux now, e.g. common list, comma, TCP IP sockets? That's from Phil. Uh, so I guess I should answer that one. Um, we punted most of the IP implementation because I mean, it used to be from the raw Ethernet packet all the way up uh, was implemented in Lisp. And when we started running on top of uh, Unix boxes, we punted on most of that IP implementation and uh, use the host OS um, socket implementation. And there are um, suburb calls into the C code that will let you open TCP connections and do things with it. Um, but it, it's, it's not, it hasn't got the best integration um, there. I mean, it's it's usable. It could use some work. Yeah. There's a lot of the code that we haven't really explored or mastered or understood what status it's in. A lot of things just work, though. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's more like you run for I, I was running for three, four days, and I finally got it after opening up 30 or 40 T edit windows. I got an error in the garbage collector. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I've run for months in the same uh, memory image without a crash. Yeah, I'm still looking for things where, you know, there's still some cases where you know, the what the C compiler does now is different from what it used to. <laughs> and uh, it uh, sometimes makes a mess of the stack. I have not been able to find those. My uh, next project is to pull out the test suites. So they had a bunch of runtime tests for checking out the interlist environment and the common list implementation somewhat. But I haven't been able to, to get those to run. Yeah, uh, that would be that would be really useful because, uh, you know, while there are some things that I know fail, uh, so I can, you know, check pretty quickly whether I've I've got the error that I you know found the error that I was looking for. Uh, there are a lot of. I'm not confident that I've got good coverage, on uh, anything in particular. And I really wish there were more documentation on the uh, on the virtual machine. Um, because all, all of the 
all of the original interlist virtual machine documentation is um, pretty much irrelevant these days to the to the C implementation of things. As there's so much there's so much infrastructure around it and so many shortcuts. Uh, you know, it's not just a nice clean VM with you know everything beautifully principled and <laughs> well documented. Yeah, because those things crawl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, anyway. Well. Um, yeah, let me just see if there's any other comments. If anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, Bill may be interested in fixing the interlist. I have a question. Um, a lot of projects like this look beautiful to me, but a lot of people will just glance at it and be like, oh, no, this is really old and... Uh, I noticed that like squeak looked pretty ugly for a while and Pharaoh kind of started to clean it up. What would it take to like reskin this, if you will, or give it a theme? Is that an idea that would uh, have some path forward or would it have to be invented to uh, give it a new look? I think a couple, go ahead. We did have color at one time, but that kind of, went by the board at some point and but it could be brought back right so it would make a lot of difference there was an implementation called xmas which basically you know a layer on top of this that converted all of you know larry's windows that are opening would just open natively on x um eh, how stable that is at this point in time i couldn't say. Uh, I don't know that anyone's tried to <laughs> load it in the environment to see what it does. Uh, um, and it also had some other quirks because of the very different way that defining a window existed. Yeah. You take, take this demo of Hanoi. Yeah. I didn't say, how would you translate that? There's, there's, uh, in the virtual machine implementation, there's a file called uh, mnxmath, um, which uh, has a little bit of documentation about what John was thinking um, needed to be done in order to make the, uh, the windows open as native X windows. But on the other hand, X windows are pretty ugly. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, the other part of it is that it's based on what you would want to do in X windows, which is already a uh, abandonware. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so this is, X windows is mechanism, not policy. I mean, you can, right. the whole yeah. point is that with a good window manager, you can reskin it however you like. Yeah. 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 And um, right now, what we've got is a great big, uh, black and white window, and and uh, Interlist does all the drawing directly on that. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And then for this color stuff, what's something I could search in the code repo to find uh, the vestigial bits of that? Uh, in the Interlist code, you'll find uh, bits, I think, in LL color, maybe. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And in the virtual machine, uh, um, the only color support that's in there is for when you had a Sun CG6, maybe, um, video card, a and it would draw directly, it, you know, it, it relied on a memory map um, color display that was treated as a a separate, for the most part, is a, you know a, another display, um, and I think we might have at one point had a color X window, but 
I don't think there's I don't think that code is there anymore. Right. You know, so the window world on color screen. I wonder what window world off does. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't do that. If you want to save your, uh, <laughs> save your VM. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I'll dig around on those. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that ne would need work is, uh, well, let's see. So bitblit, um, and all of the bitblit support needs to know about um, 8 and 24-bit oh, right. things. And the drawing code needs to draw on non-1-bit per pixel uh, things. And um, the, the reason it's, it runs as a separate screen is because there is no room in the list virtual memory uh, for a big color display. Um, in fact, the, on black and white screens, you're limited because uh, it's a, there's two, I think it's two megabits in the, in the VM that represent the, the black and white display. And you can have any window you or any screen size you want, as long as it's less than two megabits in total. Is that okay. just a defined one? Just change? No, it's because it manages the it manages its own virtual memory, and that's the space that's allocated, right? Because it's saved as part of the system image. But Nick, if you were looking for a weekend project, <laughs> upgrading to 64-bit pointers. Uh, <laughs> um, well, that's not break backward compatibility pretty badly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're we're just yeah, to be realistic. Getting this system so that it's bug free and people get they're willing to go through a little bit of pain, reduce the pain, but I don't think it will, will be zero. No, yeah. So you two will look archaic in like five years minimum. Right. We maximum. More likely two. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the problem with outline fonts is that they're not. They're, they don't turn themselves into bit, 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 bitmap fonts. They use grayscale of the, that was part of John Warnock's patent at Xerox was, uh, or some of them, maybe at Adobe, that you use the color display they show text with higher resolution than you have in the screen. And Apple has done quite a bit with it. And anyway, it's not a matter of adding color. The old color support still would look pixelated. And then actually when it comes to rendering text, um, when you're when you're using, you know, Outline fonts. You the, the the letters have fractional uh, pixel widths. Um, yeah. For for the cases where you're doing um, a fixed width uh, display, like the, the font is fixed width, that you may be able to, to deal with that just fine. But if it's if you're using something that's a variable width uh, font, you'll you'll end up having you know depending on where it is in around the other text around it, the relative to the other text around it, it may actually have different pixels. Yeah. And and there are no outline fonts in Interlist on the display. They're all, all bitmap. There are both fixed and variable width fonts, but they're all bitmap fonts. They're all bitmap. So in order to get interesting new fonts, you know, we definitely need to convert them to bitmap. And we also need to convert them to uh, 
from Unicode uh, tables to XCCS tables, which means we need a conversion from Unicode to XCCS, which sort of exists, but not really. Well, I would go the other way, you know. And I don't think there's a lot of XCCS stuff around. I would go the other way and just make everything, convert everything to Unicode internally and be done with it. I have no complaints, but uh, I would think that would be a, a a bigger, you know, a bigger effort. A lot of work. Yeah, sounds good. I, I I've got to drop off, folks. So. Okay. Um, do we have um, any other questions uh, before I close the stream? Um, if not, I I have one final comment. Uh, Dexter Summering says that's cool. I'm going to install this and play with it. Once I learn more about lists, so I think you got a new convert there. Um, That's congratulations great. Congratulations on that. Yeah, we appreciate newcomers telling us where things are. are new better. blood. We need new blood. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the efforts here is to get people into um, into Interlisp who don't belong to the first generation of Interlisp programmers. <laughs> to put it politely. I mean, I don't, but I'm just about as old. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I, th I think uh, an important point to make here is that the a lot of these efforts are... Um, things die out not because they were primitive, uh, sometimes because some particular feature was important. The fact that DOS beat this out wasn't that DOS was better. It was it was cheaper at just the right time or something. Exactly. Uh, so there's a lot of really important thought that is in these systems, even if they're not exactly integrated with modern systems, there's a great deal to learn. Yeah, like the DOS was able to run on a, a machine with like, you know, less than a meg of RAM, which, you know, um, was probably not feasible for something like Interlust with the amount of graphics that it had and everything. Oh, I, you'd be surprised, right? I mean, uh, it it was running on the D machines. You really didn't have very much memory. Yeah, I can imagine. But uh, you, you probably were very hamstrung in terms of what you could do with it, right? No, it looked just like this. It was the the display was twelve eighty by ten twenty four, mm -hmm. um, and it was. Uh, um, 32 megabytes at most in in those days. Right. Uh, yeah, that was probably like a 24 bit address space, ridiculously large, yeah. with 16 bit words. Yeah. I mean, it was probably just an issue of marketing in a lot of ways. I mean, I definitely recall at Symbolics at one point one of one of the presidents that we had wanted to position us against a word processor system saying basically uh, both of these machines seem to be designed for a personal user. They've got an editor and so on. And it depends a lot on how you perceive what it is you're selling and how you package it, uh, not just what its capability is. Yeah, that's also true. Hey, Ken, I wanted to ask you about the uh, common list fiber spec. <laughs> I wanted uh, to get, get a house this for common list to work in this environment. Uh, you wanted to do it? I want to just, if people want to need help, I could need common list help, could, could we? Uh... I don't have control over the intellectual property of that, unfortunately. Um, the the um, DPNS 3 spec is more or less believed to be in the public domain. That's a little complicated there. Um, and one could write a processor like the one that I wrote for producing the hyperspec, but it's uh, ListWorks Limited is the one that owns that. And I've periodically consulted with them to do stuff, but I mean, they use it as an advertising vehicle. Um, there have been periodic suggestions of making some new thing. And uh, if you look on Twitter and you search probably for hyperspec and me, you might see some discussion. Yeah. I've been thinking about maybe adding a URL file system as a way of getting getting interlist more useful. 
you can send me some email and, and um, we could talk about what the various options are. All right. The tests, somebody needs to run the tests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is to say the common list tests. So um, if you guys are cool, I'd like to uh, close the stream um, and we're going to, we can continue the discussion, more stuff about this and any, anything else you want to talk about, we could be, but I figure now is a good time, really. Um, so um, uh, I want to thank you, Larry, um, for uh, giving a great talk. I also want to thank Ron Kaplan and Aaron Welch uh, for their contributions to this um, talk today. Um, Exactly. Let's clap on that. Um, so uh, don't forget to, oh, let me show my face here. Um, don't forget to like this video and share it on your Reddits, your Hacker Newses, your Twitters, or wherever you like to express yourselves. Um, and if you haven't subscribed already and hit the notify button, don't miss out because we're going to have a great lineup next year. So do that right now. Um, I'd also, uh, since it's the end of the year, I'd also like to thank our other organizers for their contrib contributions this year. Um, Zoe Breiterman, our um, social media manager uh, for keeping our socials on fire, and Jeff Parker, our videographer um, for that, and is also uncountably infinite contributions through the years. Thank you guys. Um, and of course, I want to thank our, all our speakers for 2020. Thank you guys again. Um, I'm forever grateful to the community for watching, sharing, and supporting us. So thank you guys too. And um, so um, I don't know if you guys know this, but it's Grace Hopper's birthday tomorrow. So I say we start celebrating a little early. So that's what we'll do now while I close the parentheses uh, for the stream. Um, so uh, to everyone out there, Merry Interlistmas. Bye. I know. Thanks, Arthur. <laughs>